Returning to Gabriel's songbook, I'm uh, going to read chapter four today, um, which has a little bit of music in it. So I've got my guitar strapped on, and we'll see how it works out. I'm not sure I'll be able to, to pull it off exactly like I would like to. But um, anyway, so here's, uh, I'm going to look at chapter four of the novel. It's called Dancing on Air. This is how I pictured it. I'd be sitting in the guest chair at the side of David Letterman's desk or lounging on a couch in my home outside Nashville and chatting with somebody like Barbara Walters. Near the end of the interview, I'd look straight into the camera and tell Eliza the day and time I'd be back together. And on that day, at the appointed hour, I'd arrive at the salon or wherever she lived, unfolding from the back of a long black limousine or stepping down from a shiny silver tour bus just as the air brakes hissed. Meanwhile, I lived in Billy Keith's building on the corner of 18th Avenue and South Street, an old two-story brick house that had been converted into office space. Double glass doors led from the concrete porch into the receptionist area where a 24-year-old chain-smoking redhead named Kate reigned over the activity that daily swirled through the first floor offices of Billy's publishing, production, and farming interests. A thickly carpeted staircase with a gate at the bottom mounted the wall left of Kate's cluttered desk. The right side of the second floor was Billy's office, the left side my apartment. At night I was alone in the building. The place surrounded me with an even more deathly quiet than had the apartment above the funeral hall. Without the extra money to buy or rent a television, I budgeted $5 a week for paperbacks from a used bookstore in Hillsborough Village, often filling the quiet nights with the voices of Hawthorne and Fitzgerald, Shakespeare and Joyce, Tolkien and McMurtry. I listened to music, Springsteen, Roxy Music, Hoyt Axton, Dallas Holm, Kate Bush, Aaron Copeland, Nancy Griffith, Don Williams. Bruce Coburn, Jean-Pierre Rompard. When the mood to write came over me, I strapped on one of my guitars. My old guild, or Uncle T's Martin, that Aunt Myrtle gave me the night before I left Runyon, and climbed up and down the dark steps for hours, covering every square inch of the building that was open to me, singing, thinking, writing, singing, rewriting, singing. When I finally lay down, Eliza stirred inside me a transient ache that moved beneath my skin. Sometimes, certain I'd felt her touch my chest or back, I awoke with a start and searched the darkness of the bed in a sleepy daze. Then I'd get up and dress and plod the nighttime sidewalks. Again she'd be there, her fingers laced with mine, her footsteps the echo of my own in the quiet and empty spaces. I awoke one April morning to the hammering and beeping of Kate's typewriter. Whenever she let up, I heard the laughter and conversation of Frank Long and John Withers, the office guys, standing around the coffee maker as they did every morning, pumping up for work and laying bets on whether or not Billy would show up that day. I showered and dressed, planning to run a few errands and then meet engineer George McDougall for lunch. I'm bringing a guy named Lucas Carroll along to meet you, George had said when he telephoned the night before. Who's that? He plays piano and guitar and he's got a studio in his house. I think you guys might hit it off. I was winding my way downstairs when the telephone started ringing in my apartment. Even though it had been almost a year now, my breath stuck in my chest every time I heard that sound, so I ran back up the stairs, fumbled with my keys, finally getting the door open on the fourth ring. Hello? What's up, Gabe? I immediately recognized the booming radio voice of Jay Wheeler, who, along with Wiley Fastenau, Cutter, and me had made up uh, an almost inseparable quartet of friends at Runyon High School. He'd begun working afternoons at Runyon's 500-watt WHMM, where hits make memories, as soon as he turned 16. 
Since graduation, he'd worked himself into the midday shift. We all figured the place would be his one of these days. Jay had recorded those first radio station demos for me, the first songs of mine that Billy Keith had heard. Hey, Jay, I said. Not much going on here, man. How are things at home? Fine, fine, he said. We got Lacey in today. What? The 45, at least. You're kidding. I've got it right here on my turntable, ready to go. Anything you want to say to the folks back home before I debut it? I sat down in the bay window and started playing with the tangle I'd worked into the phone cord during the last few calls I'd received. Will you call my mom real quick and tell her to listen? Already did. Hold on. I heard Jay flipping switches and listened while he read a spot for Whitson's Green Grocer. Okay, Runyon, Jay said, his voice tinny and distant over the telephone line. Old Jay's got a big surprise coming up for you right after the latest headlines from UPI, your local weather and sports. Stay tuned. The UPI newscaster's voice droned in the background and Jay came back on the line. So, you want to say anything? I'm a total blank. Didn't you know it was coming out today? I hadn't heard a word. Well, well, I just thought you were shocked that our one-seat shit shack got it in. Jay flipped more switches. I'm going to go ahead and play the record right now. You get your little thoughts in order and call me back this afternoon, say around 2 my time. We'll do an interview. Okay, thanks, Jay. Talk to you then. I stepped out the door of the apartment and called down to Kate. If BK checks in, I need to talk to him. Soon after I got back from lunch, UPS delivered two boxes of the Lacey 45s. I sat on the couch holding one of the small black records. The label was royal blue. At the top, in sky blue, the words Stallion Records circled the head of a billowing and billowing mane of a white horse. My name was on the label twice, once in block white letters as the recording artist, once in tiny letters under Lacey as the songwriter. It was the version released to the radio stations, and the same song and label were on the other side, too. I called Jay and did the interview, turning the record over in my hands the whole time, amazed. I got an excited call from Mom and then put in a call to Cutter in Knoxville. I started to try Eliza at Masterworks, but before I could pick up the receiver and dial her number, the telephone rang. Gabby, how are you? Billy Keith said. Kate said you needed to talk to me. She didn't tell you what? No, she just said to call. Lacey came out to, at the radio stations today. It did. The telephone line hissed for a second as if the call were coming from far away. Well, what day is it? Billy asked. It's Friday, 22nd. Well, I guess that's right then, Billy said. We set it up when I was in New York last month. Just forgot to tell you, son, plain and simple. Why did it come out to country stations? I'm not a country act. Well, we decided to blanket pop, AC and country with the first single. Ain't nothing wrong with picking up some airtime on any station where we can get at it. Okay, when's the album coming out? I'm sure it's three weeks or so, somewhere around the middle of May. I need to look at my papers. I'll let you know. Is there anything I should be doing? Do I need to get a band together? No, hell, you need the hassle of dealing with a band about as much as you need that damn manager of yours. The scrape of a cigarette lighter sounded over the telephone, followed by Billy's heavy exhalation. But here's what you can do. I've got some independent promotion men lined up to help out the label boys. I'll get you a list of radio stations, and starting Monday, you can just go to calling them. Uh, see if they got the record in, and if they'll listen to it. Okay. If you hear from Mr. Moe, don't tell him about it. Don't talk to him about it. Gotta run, son. See you soon. I hadn't heard from Moe Biggs in a couple of months. While little was happening through February, March, and the 1st of April, he'd quit calling and quit showing up every few days to check on things. Billy's plan to cut the manager out of the loop seemed to be working. But not long after the reviews of Lacey began hitting the trades, Biggs was in my life day and night, heralded by either a ringing telephone or the banging 
of a handful of keys on the glass of the double doors downstairs at night when the office was closed. He knew Billy was trying to squeeze him out. He threatened legal action against anybody he could drag into court over the matter, and he demanded that I act as his spy and report on everything that went on in Billy Keith's offices. I said I'd keep my eyes open, and I hated myself for it. I still believed that Billy, what Billy had said, Mo Biggs would be a stumbling block, a liability, but that didn't make it any easier when Biggs sat on the couch in the apartment, eaten up with frustration and heartburn, huffing and puffing after the climb up the stairs, wiping the sweat off his reddened, round face, wringing his white hands, complaining about getting screwed. A time or two, this scene almost drove me to tell him that I was in on the plot to make him quit. But even the guilt I felt couldn't convince me to forgive the unfairness of the management contract and the awkward position he had put me in that early morning at the Crossville Waffle House. I hung on to what I'd heard Billy say time and time again. Don't worry, it's just business. Happens all the time. Stallion Records arranged for me to lip-sync Lacey during a May appearance on Dancing on Air, a live afternoon dance show from Philadelphia with a regular cast of kids from all over the city and an audience made up of viewers throughout Pennsylvania and New Jersey. The day before, Kate took me shopping for new clothes. What do you think about this, Gabriel? She stepped aside to show me what she'd laid together on a table in Kastner Knott's men's department. I turned away from the clearance rack of flannel shirts and studied the ensemble. A raw silk jacket, a slick and colorful silk shirt with a vaguely Mexican-looking print and designer jeans. The Mexican lounge lizard, eh, muchacha? I smiled and turned back to the sale shirts. I'm serious. Turn around and look again. I turned and looked at her. This is exactly what my boss and yours told me to get for you, she said. You're kidding. I looked at the clothes again. Kate, I've never worn anything like that in my life. Well, welcome to your afterlife, she said, pulling a credit card from her purse. Before we left the mall, she also picked out a pair of short boots made from a soft cream-colored leather and a belt that matched them. Now for a haircut, Kate said when we were back in the car. What? You're going on TV, Gabriel, and you haven't had a haircut since I've known you. Yeah, and I'm not getting one. Your boss, I don't care what our boss says, Kate. I'm wearing the clothes he wants, but I'm not letting anybody else touch my hair. What do you mean by anybody else, she said as I drove up the ramp toward I-65. I made a big deal of checking my mirrors as I merged into the southbound lanes, cleared my throat a couple of times, then lit a cigarette. Well, she said, that ponytail's gone way down over your collar. I trimmed my own hair. I didn't know what would come out of her mouth, maybe something along the lines of, looks like it, or I can tell. No matter what it was, I knew it would have a laugh behind it. It won't hurt, she said and chuckled. I've already made an appointment at Leota's on 17th. It's where I go. I trimmed my own hair, I said again, and fixed my attention on driving so much that she didn't say another word. Back at the office, I carried the bags up to my apartment, grumbling just loud enough to be sure Kate heard me. I haven't matched this much since Mom used to dress me for Easter. When everybody left the office for the day, I went out and bought a six-pack of Dos Equis. I returned to the apartment and drank three of the beers very quickly. While they took effect, I unpacked the outfit and put it on. Then I laid one of the Lacey 45s on the turntable, set the repeat button, shouldered the Martin, and glanced, planted myself in front of the mirror in the bedroom. When the music started, I dipped my right knee and nearly fell into the bedside table, blaming it on the beer. I tried my left, swaying it from side to side, and thought that looked like a, I was shaking an embarrassing accident down the leg of my pants. 
a swivel of swivel of my hips and instead of the elvis the pelvis look i expected i got my own father trying to dance you're in deep shit i said to the mirror wishing i'd taken eliza dancing more often and let her teach me the secrets of fluid movement to music i discovered a smooth groove between my neck and shoulders and thought that looked okay but i kept losing the rhythm every few bars I gave up on my body and concentrated on my lips, trying to sing the song exactly with the record, exaggerating my facial expressions and the movement of my mouth and jaws for a stronger visual effect. As that felt more and more familiar, I closed my eyes and mimicked the mental picture I held of myself on stage. When I peeked at the mirror again, I thought I looked more comfortable, but then self-consciousness turned me back into an unoiled Tin Man. I put my guitar down and turned off the music, stripped off the clothes and threw them on the bed. Then I quickly downed the other three beers. Naked and buzzing, I sat down at the piano and fumbled over the keys until I found a chord progression and a hint of melody to slow my racing heart and bring some order to my swirling mind. After a few minutes of trying various voicings for the chords of humming melody and variation, I held down the sustain pedal and let a jazzy cluster of notes ring and picked up my pen. Off and running, off and coming, morning in the east. The sluggishness of my drunken piano hands annoyed me, so I reached for my guild. The strings under my fingers and the hollow body of wood against my belly felt more natural and the lyrics and music rose out of me like breath. At the piano I couldn't think of anything but the right blacks and whites, but with my old acoustic guitar in my arms my mind was free. I pictured her sleeping while I wrote, pictured the shape of her lying on her side with her back to the light that fell through the open bedroom door. The scene changed. She swirled her skirt and laughed as she bopped across a lighted floor, dancing rings around some dark partner. Then she was in bed again, writhing and moaning under the weight and thrust of that same dark figure. As I flailed the guitar, the man turned toward the light, and it was me. Too obsessed to came out west and found a place to hide. Took love, then another, never satisfied. And people say it's such a shame to see your appetite. And to see me chase the sun and end up running in the lonely nights. Look at that star again, and I see you as a queen. Standing in your blue dress, girl, you'll always be the best I Three o'clock in the morning, I sat in the bay window and played the song into a small tape recorder. Then I picked up the jumbled pile of new clothes from the bed and led them, laid them out on the back of the couch and turned off the lights. Just before sleepover came me, I pulled the wedding band from my finger and dropped it in the drawer of the bedside table. The next morning, Kate told me I looked awful and drove me to the airport. At the gate, she handed me spending money from Billy and put me on the plane. Jack Widmark, a music marketing consultant working with Stallion Records, picked me up at the Philadelphia airport and drove me to the suburban studios of WPHL 17. Widmark was older than most men I'd met in the music business, graying but trim his judge-like bearing betrayed only by a wide smile. We'll meet my wife and have something to eat when the show is over, he said as he held the front door of the studio open for me and my guitar. During a commercial break, I was directed to a small stage and stool to one side of where Dancing On Air's host and producer Hal Lages uh, coached the kids on the setup of the performance sequence. Now and then, a girl or two in the crowd of dancers looked my way and smiled. 
The kids all ran together to gather around me when the commercial ended. They hooped and hollered and clapped their hands so that I could hardly hear the music start. We all did the best we could. The kids were used to dancing to Man Eater, Baby Come to Me, and Billie Jean, not string-laden adaptations of old Appalachian ballads. One young couple even tried something like a waltz, and I focused my attention on them. At first, they were dressed neatly and every hair was in place. Although they smiled a lot, their movements were self-conscious and awkward. Their faces shone with the nervous sweat and oil that is the curse of teenagers. Watching, <clears throat> I realized how much like them Eliza and I must have looked that night at the Dam Dam. It wasn't the image of us in that moment that I'd always, that had always been in my head, but it was probably the truer picture. Embarrassed, wondering what other romanticized tableaus of our life together weren't as perfect as I'd imagined them to be, I turned away from the couple and focused on the music. I tried to change my performance with every ounce, charge my performance with every ounce of the energy that surged through me whenever I performed for real. Without microphone or amplifier, I began to bang the chords and belt out the lyrics, paying attention to the music above my head only enough to keep my lips in sync. But it didn't work. It was all a contrivance, as stagey as a scene in a cheesy musical. The forest glade, enter a lover inspired to song, suddenly swell of violins. As a camera rolled through the group of kids who danced in front of me, I smiled broadly at the image of string sections in concert black, lined up on tree limbs like roosting crows. Jack and Roberta Widmark, Hal Leguess and Hal's mother Antonia, sat around me at a table in an Italian restaurant not far from the television studio. Hal related some of the favorable comments the kids on the show had about me, that I seemed comfortable and made them feel the same, that they liked my sense of humor when they swirled around me at the end of the show, and that they liked the sound of the song and wished they could have heard it a little better. Are you married, young man? Antonia Leges broke in. I glanced down at the naked fing ring finger on my left hand, at the pale depression still visible on my skin. I laid the hand in my lap. No, ma'am, I'm not, I said. You should be, Antonia Leggett said. My Hal, he's not married to. She took another swirl of spaghetti into her mouth and kept talking. Hal says you make beautiful music, no? You should have a wife. Make music to her at night. Make mood for her, make love with her. None of this running around the country. You'd be a lover, no? She laughed and raised her eyebrows. I blushed under Antonia Leguess's gazing, smiling gaze, and the rest of the table laughed. You generally got about six weeks, Jack Widmark said that night over coffee. I sat with Roberta and him at the kitchen table in the cabin they owned in the Delaware Valley countryside north of Philadelphia. The windows were open, as were the French doors that led outside to a deck. A light breeze wandered in and out of the room, carrying with it the sounds of crickets and frogs, and now and then the haunting call of an owl or the swish of a car passing far out on the two lanes. If you can't get enough ads from the reporting stations to get Lacey on the charts by then, you're through with it. The record's dead in the water. It's been four weeks already, I said. Can I do something to make it happen? You're the artist. That means a lot to some stations, some of the smaller ones, but you're a new name. The bigger ones still aren't going to give you anything. They've got to have promo men. Uh, they trust, they got to have their egos stroked, got to have their perks, Billy knows. Jack got up and poured himself another cup of coffee. Do you see him often? Well, not really. I know he's not touring much anymore, but he's rarely around. I think I've only seen him twice since the record came out. Yeah, I was afraid of that. Widmark set his coffee down and picked up Roberta's cup and mine and refilled them. 
I think the man's a little flighty, talented but flighty, a good ear for music but not much head for business. I like him, Roberta said, leaning across the table toward me. He's funny. But being married to Jack, I've met a lot of people in the music business, and Billy's one that I can't figure out. He talks a good game, but I just don't know. She lifted her face and smiled when her husband set the fresh cup of coffee in front of her. He's in that gray area between creativity and business savvy, Widmark said. His kind sometimes has trouble crossing that line with any grace. I'm almost afraid to ask this, I said. Billy told me the album would be out by now, but it's not. Is there a problem? Jack Widmark took a long sip of, from his coffee cup. Stallion, Stallion put it off for a couple of weeks. There was a meeting Monday. Billy was there. He didn't tell you that either? No. Well, he should have. Jack rubbed his eyes and looked at the clock. Damn, it's two in the morning already. What should he have told me? I said. There are two ideas on the table at Stallion right now. One is to continue with the present setup and do the album release in the middle of June. Lacey hasn't made the charts, but they feel like it's gotten enough response to go ahead. The other idea is for the company to go public, sell stock, raise enough capital to break away from Warner Brothers and function on its own. If that happens, the album will be shelved until the changeover is complete. It could take a while. A year, even. I didn't breathe. It was all I could do to keep my face from twisting like my gut. As uncomfortable as I'd felt during my Dancing on Air performance, I wanted to keep rolling, to build a career. If Lacey didn't hit, I wanted another single out, another show to do, an album, a band, a tour. Well, which way do you think it's going to go? I said finally. Right now, I'm afraid they might go the public route. It's a new company, and the board is still too excited about being in business. They don't have a love for the music yet. Widmark wrapped his knuckles twice on the table. Billy should have told you. Gabriel, I want to tell you something, Roberta said. I've listened to your tape almost every day since Jack brought it home. It's wonderful music. Thanks. You don't need to be involved with business people. It'll hurt you. It'll hurt your creativity. You need to be taken care of by someone who sees what you are and what you can do. Someone who can make it all happen. I know that sounds vague, but Jack and I were talking about last night. I shifted in my chair and wrapped my hands around the warm cup in front of me. Billy is moving from one career to the next, Roberta went on after another sip of coffee. He's carrying you hoping to get you into a position where you'll be able to carry him. But the music business is shaky ground. If he falls, he might take you down with him before you even get started. We're not saying you shouldn't work with him, Jack said. I love the guy, I really do. And he did a creative job uh, producing your album. But as soon as you get the chance, you need to separate from him a bit. Look for a business person you can put between yourself Billy. There was already somebody between Billy and me, but I was sure that Mo Biggs wasn't what Jack had in mind. The coffee fought an uphill battle against the clock. Yawns went around the table like a peace pipe. Finally, the Widmarks said good night and went upstairs. I climbed up to the loft that looked out over the richly decorated living room. As I undressed, my mind tumbled backwards through the conversation about Billy Keith and the record company. I wasn't shocked by what the Widmarks had said. More than once during my first year in Nashville, I'd felt some of what they'd put into words. What shocked me was realizing that the chaos my life suddenly seemed to be in wasn't going to keep me awake. I was tired, as tired as I'd ever been. Eliza was there as I lay down, the familiar ache she'd become smelled her perfume, its blend of honeysuckle and musk, on the breeze that moved in and out of the cabin's windows. And yet, as sleepy and tired as I was, I lay awake a long time, breathing deeply and listening to the rush of the stream that passed beside the deck at the back of the house. Beyond the dirty strand of sand, 
The dunes are hotels rising above the breeze-bent beach grass and swimming pools. The sky to the west, gray. The hotels jutting against it are only a more concrete shade of gray. The windswept table umbrellas and glittering aqua pools, the patchy brown sound in my peach white skin, gray. The warm water of the ocean laps around my ankles playfully as it comes in, but as it returns, it swirls under my bare heels and tries to steal my footing. Water runs farther up the beach and returns, foaming around my feet with an agitation akin to malice. My heels sank, waiting for solid ground. I stumble backward, turn and take a couple of steps into the water to regain my balance and stop, frozen. All the gray water is leaving, rushing to join the uprising in the east, from north to south, farther even than the curve of the earth should reveal. Gray water is pulling itself into the gray sky. I sprint south along the beach, feet pound on the packed wet sand, heart pounds in my throat. Out of breath, I stop and look toward the line of hotels beyond to the mountains and back to the ocean. The wave lifts its head into the clouds and begins to crest. I stand and stare waiting for my body to be broken by the crash and borne by the surge washed up on the shores of home. All right, and with that reading of uh, chapter four, uh, that little dream at the end, a little nightmare of sorts um, at the end, that's, uh, that's the end of the fourth chapter, Dancing on Air. Okay. Um, be back with more sometime uh, again soon. All right, take care.